of that famous song in the musical here, which says, this is the age of Aquarius, for those of you who are old enough to remember the musical, the young generation don't even attempt, you're, you're out of the picture. It is that musical that was singing the, the sliding back of the vernal equinox at the rate of one degree every hundred years, which was the value from the ancient uh, Greek times. The fresh measurements in Baghdad determined that that sliding back is only one degree, actually is much faster, it goes one degree every 70 years. And hence, there are all sorts of repercussions that uh, will result from that. The solar apogee was supposed to be fixed in the Greek value. It was turned out with a fresh observation that it is a moving value. And so on and so forth. So in other words, I can assure you, and these are documented in my latest book that uh, Professor Al-Hassani was kind enough to mention, uh, 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 every single fundamental value uh, that is simply called fundamental astronomical parameters, all of them were found to be faulty because they were observing 700 years later. It's very simple. There is a reason for that. And then the fresh measurements were such, such good measurements that we still use them. And in all cases, uh, this, we still use the same precession value that was observed in Baghdad, the same inclination, as I said. We still think that the solar apogee moves, and so on and so forth. So, once you do that, now I want to tell you the different story. If you are a scientist and you are working in a lab, and you are a good observer and a good science, uh, uh, observational scientist, and you find in a discipline that one value after another are faulty, what do you do? Don't you begin to jump and ask the bigger questions? You get emboldened, because now you can determine that there are all those mistakes. So therefore, this alien civilization, the Greek civilization, no longer impresses you. So hence, you begin to create new ideas, and then you begin to create science, and that's apparently what has happened. One of them is the fundamental theoretical consideration that underlies all of Greek astronomy. As I just said at the very beginning, all Greek astronomy depends on the fact that we are stuck within very solid spheres. That's what Aristotle told us, and before Newton, thanks to the Royal Society also, a member of the Royal Society, before Newton, the whole world was conceived with this kind of cosmology stuck to it. We, the whole world moves with spheres moving in place, and they are solid spheres, they don't have the freedom to meander as they go. The Greek tradition tells us that if we are placed here at the Earth as observer, any planet is supposed to be moving on a small epicycle and hence giving it an explanation for the loopings that the planets normally make in the heavens, but that this, the, this uh, sphere that carries the planet, it's called the epicycle, is itself carried within a shell, this light blue shell, and here I should thank the American scientist people who did this graphics for me, it's very, very nice, I like it. And this blue shell, the proposition from the Greek tradition it, uh, tells us that this blue shell moves in place as a solid sphere. It's a solid shell. You can assume it is made of uh, brass or iron, whatever. Moves in place, not on an axis that goes through the Earth, nor on an axis that goes through its center, but on an axis that is off-center, called the equator. Now, to prove to you that this is really impossible, physically impossible, I invite you to look at this fantastic little clip that my friend Ali Nouri had just uh, uh, con concluded for me this morning. You remember those basketball players who take the basketball and they spin it on their fingers? You see? As long as the finger is growing through the axis, the ball works. It can spin in place. The minute you move it out, it falls off. Okay? So physically impossible to go on with a cosmology that tells me that there is a spin. For those who didn't see it, I think we should repeat it. <laughs> Actually, I like the way it fell out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You see? The minute the axis moves off the center, looks what happens. That's what people who translated the early text from the Greek, that's what they noticed. They noticed that, they are not, that the Greeks are not talking about a real physical sphere. Because a ball is a real physical sphere, and it doesn't behave like that when you are forcing it to, to move on an axis that doesn't go through its center. So now we can see that, that that sphere that doesn't run on the center is embedded in every single mathematical configuration that came into Arabic from the Greek tradition. And I will just give you one illustration. I, I don't have the time to give you all of them. For in the case of the movement of the moon, Ptolemy, who was who concocted this model at, the, at uh, about 150 AD, tells us that for an observer here at the Earth, 
the, the, uh, the sphere that's there, the shell, by the way, is represented by a circle here, that carries this epicycle also has to be moved by such a way that the outer sphere moves it in this direction, itself moves back in that direction, so that it creates a crank mechanism, and at the same time, it doesn't move uniformly around its center, but off-center. Here again, it will fall off, just exactly like that uh, basketball. But he needed to do that, I and mean, Ptolemy was not an idiot. He said he needed to do that because he noticed that, the, that the, in measuring the longitude of the moon, when it is about 90 degrees away from the sun, there, there is a difference between the actual position of the moon and the mean position of the moon is usually larger than the moon's movement at other places. Hence, he needed to enlarge this angle. So what does he do? He created this current mechanism to bring the epicycle closer to the Earth. And you notice the distances here. He brought it to about 39 units when it was already at the time when it in conjunction with the sun, it was at 60 units. This fine. It solved the problem for the longitude maximization of the angle. But it created another problem. Immediately, any object that is brought from a distance halfway should look twice as big. And the proof is that if I put my, eye, my hand in front of my eye, I don't see the wall behind it. It doesn't mean that my hand is bigger than the wall. It simply means that my hand is too close to my eye. Hence, the distance of the object from the eye is a very important distance. And if we were to follow Ptolemy and believe what he said, then the moon, that is at the new moon, totally dark and seen, but at full moon, <coughs> has the value at 60 degrees. When I bring it down to 39, it's almost halfway down should look twice as big. The Mishadr of Damascus, who died in 1375, said, Wada Mura I have never seen the moon at quarter moon begin to be twice as big as when it is a full moon. Therefore, the mathematics that Ptolemy was using is erroneous. Hence, we should develop a better mathematics to describe the same phenomenon, meaning yield a, a greater angle at 90 degrees, but does not disturb and distort the visible disk of the moon. And that is the model that Ibn Shatter concocted. Notice what he did, he added another epicycle here, but he kept the distance of the main epicycle at the same distance from the observer, therefore there is no distortion of sight. But at 90 degrees, he mounted them in such a way that you have a bigger angle here than the angle you would have there. It solves the observations, it solves the cosmology, and it gets away from that ridiculous notion that the moon at quadrature should look twice as big. But now I invite you to look at this other one. This one, Agnishakar died in 1375. This model for the lunar motion is described by Copernicus, who died in 1542, <coughs> about 150 years later. And now I invite you to look at the arrangement of those two epicycles when it is in conjunction with the sun at 90 degrees to create a larger angle. Angle for angle, vector for vector, radius for radius, is exactly the same model as that of Ibn Shatter. I'll give you a second to internalize this. This model, all I have to do is cock this one up a little bit so that you will see that it's identical. Now, if a person has solved a problem 150 years before, and now the same solution appears again, shouldn't we ask, did he know about the work of Ibn Shatter? At the beginning, most people said, and this, by the way, was discovered in 1957, most people said, yeah, 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 this happens because there are lots of times when scientists coincidentally solve the problem in the same way. I say yes, but hold your breath, there are other things coming. <laughs> when it comes to the, to the movement of the planet Mercury, again, it has the same problem. The planet Mercury of the uh, Ptolemy here concocts a model to bring the 